Good evening. Thank you for coming and joining us for tonight's Live from the Library program. My name is Greg Merrill, and I'm the president of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And I want to welcome you to 1969. <laughs> it, was, it was an extraordinary year that really did define an iconic era. Some of you may remember that 1969 included these defining moments. The first moon landing, Woodstock, the Native American occupation of Alcatraz, the Stonewall riots, and the Miracle Mets. Tonight we've created an evening of memory, music, and discussion about remarkable moments from that transformational year. Meg Honey, at the far end of our panel, is tonight's moderator. She's an adjunct associate professor at St. Mary's College and a curriculum specialist with Pearson. She's a regular moderator of the Newsmaker Speaker Series at the Lesher Center. And in 2017, she was Mount Diablo Unified School District's Teacher of the Year. I also want to extend a special thank you to our live program sponsors, the East Bay Times, Minimap Press of Lafayette, and the Friends of the Walnut Creek Library. I also want to get, extend special thanks to our Executive Director, Susan Moon, to our Program Director, Jennifer Sharon, and to all of you for coming out here on such a hot, hot night. At the end of the evening, we're doing something a little different if you've been here with us for live programs. Um, board members will be uh, saying goodnight at the end of the show with buckets in hand uh, in a little thing that I've stolen from Cal Shakes. Uh, in the hopes that you'll recognize that we really can't do these types of programs without you. So if there's any contributions, no matter how small, we will be very grateful to receive them. And Carol Weinstra, our current program director and past president, and I have agreed to share and match whatever you put in the bucket. Wow. So if you like the show, Donate $5. If you don't like me or you don't like Carol, <laughs> donate $10. <laughs> now, please help me welcome Meg Hines, who will introduce our panelists. And thank you again. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Well, here we are. I, I love watching my father's reaction to the matching um, bucket promise. He clearly was not aware of this arrangement, so that was really, really awesome. Um, thank you, Greg, and um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I am so excited to be here tonight to moderate another Live from the Library event, and I have to say that I enjoyed every moment preparing for tonight's panel. Um, to Greg's um, remarks, 1969 was truly a year of incredible achievements, transformative moments, and era-defining events. Um, I don't know, do we want to turn these down? Yeah? <laughs> the LSD light show will not have its full effect. <laughs> yeah, good? Good, okay, perfect. Um, Thunderclap Newton's uh, one-hit wonder served as sort of an anthem for the year. Lock up the streets and houses because there's something in the air. We've got to get together sooner or later because the revolution's here. And you know it's right. And you know that it's right. In remembering the 1960s, however, much of the American historical memory is actually rooted in 1968. No. Rob Kirkpatrick has written extensively about tonight's year of focus and has said this. 1968, with its assassinations and riots, seemed to have lasted in the collective consciousness, consciousness as the year that embodies the turbulent late 60s. One colleague even jokingly suggested that I call my book 1969, the year after the important year. <laughs> Turn the calendar over from 1968, though, and one finds a 12-month period that is unparalleled in American history. Tonight, we will look at the generation, generation defining year as each season of the year unfolded. And to lead our conversation on all things 1969, Stonewall, Nixon, Zeppelin, People's Park, Apollo 11, Chappaquiddick, Woodstock, and so much more are two amazing guests. Dennis Erickson serves on the board of directors of the National Academy of Songwriters in Los Angeles, and he is as well a member of the, uh, the advisory board of, of, of About Records Incorporated. 
He has also done tremendous work in our local performing arts community and has served as president of Town Hall Theater in Lafayette. A pioneer in niche market publishing, Dennis created BAM Magazine in 1976 to give record companies, movie studios, and musical instrument manufacturers a way to reach young people on the West Coast at a reasonable cost, and made BAM the first publication to be distributed free at point of purchase retail outlets across California. In 1978, he founded the first Bay Area Music Awards, most commonly known as the Bammies, whose innovative format led it to become the most hottest and exciting ticket in town. For the last 12 years, Dennis has taught public relations courses at St. Mary's College of California, and he clearly has a groupie in the audience. I'm <laughs> loving it, and I love your outfit tonight, too, looking great. Our other panelist is Dr. Glenn Genzel, who is the chair of the history department at San Jose State University wow. and one of my favorite professors of all time. A proud Bay Area native, Dr. Genzel completed his undergraduate work at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'll stop here. He is now a visiting professor at Cal this summer teaching a California history course. Um, he then earned a master's degree and PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has taught at the University of Georgia and at Tulane University, and he completed postdoctoral research at the University of California, Irvine. After several years teaching at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, Dr. Genzel returned to the Bay Area at last to teach at San Jose State. He has published articles, book chapters, and reviews on subjects reigning, ranging from California mythology, politics, and migration, to baseball business, social memory, and McCarthyism. Please join me in welcoming our outstanding panelists. And before we officially kick off our discussion, I was hoping that you both might say a few words about 1969. Are there particular events or moments that are especially significant? Well, Glenn, you, I'll put you on the spot. You first. want me to go first? Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> well, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's great to be here with you. Uh, we're here to uh, pay homage to a date, the year 1969, and that's wonderful because historians are fond of dates. Uh, yeah, we're into it. And uh, 1969 really stands out as the culmination of an incredible decade. Historians will be the first to tell you that not all decades are created equal. <laughs> uh, some have a lot more going on in them than others. And the 1960s were just cram-packed, one of those times when you know, history hit the fast-forward button and things just started whirring past at a dizzying pace. Maybe some of you remember. Um, I have memories of the 60s too, but I was born in the 60s, so <laughs> my memories are the little kid memories uh, of the 60s, but I do, you know, now, as I've studied the history of the decade, I understand a lot of the things I remember as a child much better, uh, such as uh, hippies. Um, I, I remember seeing hippies, you know, on the side of the road, hitchhiking, uh, at least until 1969 when uh, the Manson killings put a stop to that. Nobody would pick them up anymore. Um, but um, I'm really looking forward to uh, reminiscing uh, tonight about uh, that amazing decade and uh, sharing some of the things I've studied about it with you. Dennis? And I'm Dennis Erickson, and um, I'm clearly 10 years older. So I got to be a teenager during the 60s, and I got to be a uh, thank you so much and uh, <laughs> for the applause. And um, I got to be 18 and 19 during 1969, which, by the way, for a guy, was one of the coolest year numbers that you could possibly have. So uh, I was really impressed with that. I'm sorry, as a teenager, what are you gonna do? And um, I, um, I was in a, uh, a uh, rock band that uh, had a certain amount of success during that last couple of years. So we're gonna talk about a few things that I got to do um, in 1969 because of that. And um, it was a fabulous, not only a fabulous decade, but a fabulous year, and it led to um, the opportunity for me many, you know, six years later to start BAM Magazine and change the, uh, the publishing world, which is a whole different story, and uh, I'll get to that later. Or that's like a whole other panel that we have to yeah, exactly. think about. That's, no, that's great. 
Well, as we um, open up 1969 and, and we're looking at the early months, um, our focus is going to turn both to college campuses and uh, the, the music scene and who came on uh, to, the, to the music scene. Uh, the early months of 1969 saw tremendous unrest on college campuses. Students overtook administration buildings, protested for the inclusion of new courses, and even physically attacked educators. What caused this shift from the university being viewed as the cultural and intellectual center to it being viewed as a symbol of the establishment? Oh, well, 1969 came at the end of uh, some very painful years of polarization in American society. I mean, we think we're polarized now between red states and blue states, but the 1960s were, uh, in many ways, worse. Um, the Vietnam War caused a tremendous rift in, in every uh, state. Yeah, right, right, in every state. Um, and, and really uh, split Americans right down the middle over their position on this one painful, divisive issue. So arguments uh, over the Vietnam War were exploding on television, in the streets, in the classrooms of college campuses, in dining rooms and uh, parlors of family homes where you know the generation gap came home and, and parents and children were at war with each other over the Vietnam War. Neighbors were at war. Um, that's something I remember as a kid in the 60s on our little idyllic cul-de-sac that I grew up on, just like 10 houses in one block. You knew by the end of the 60s who was pro-war and anti-war, who were the hawks and who were the doves. And it was hard for the hawks and the doves to speak to each other. Um, what town? This, this was in Palo Alto where yeah, I grew up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was born in Oakland, but we moved to Palo Alto when I was little. Um, but anyway, uh, yes, the, the college campuses had, had uh, emerged as a, um, a focus of much uh, dissent and much opposition to the Vietnam War, dating back to the Vietnam teach-ins that started at some of the major campuses, Berkeley and Michigan, for example, in uh, 65, and uh, began to spread the word that maybe the, administration, the Johnson administration line on the Vietnam War might not be entirely uh, trustworthy, right? Um, so campuses were at the forefront of the questioning of that. But I think it's a mistake to assume, as many people do, that the peace movement, the much larger peace movement of the 60s, was a campus-based movement. It really was not. Um, there, there was broad-based opposition to the Vietnam War. And uh, it was not just students. It was not just hippies. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, little old ladies with uh, fancy shoes and jewelry who were marching against the Vietnam War. There were labor unions. There were bowling clubs. Um, there, there were um, church groups um, in profusion. In fact, church groups were some of the earliest to be opposed to the war and speak out against it. Um, all kinds of community organizations uh, and uh, civil rights leaders uh, were also outspoken, most notably Martin Luther King, who came out very publicly against the Vietnam War in 1967. So. Um, Campuses, yeah, had been, you know, the site of many eruptions of protest and dissent against the Vietnam War, but they were not the whole story. Um, by the end of the 60s, the campuses were uh, better known for being the, um, the incubator of radicalism. Uh, the new left emerged early in the 1960s, even before the Vietnam War. Uh, Students for a Democratic Society, the SDS, um, was formed, uh, was founded in 1960, and their um, iconic Port Huron statement came out in 1962. And that was, you know, before 99% of Americans had even heard of Vietnam. So radicalism had been growing um, in the 1960s on campuses, and uh, that contributed to much of the student opposition to the war. Uh, some people would claim today that, st that young people opposed the war only because they were afraid of getting drafted. But remember, college students had a deferment. Yeah. They couldn't get drafted. And uh, women couldn't get drafted either. And there were plenty of them against the war, too. Uh, so it's very demeaning to suggest that the peace movement was strictly about the draft. Um, so there had been you know, a lot of campus-based protest against uh, the Vietnam War and against um, racism 
the civil rights movement was strong in a lot of campuses. 1969 saw some uh, local eruptions that were uh, very public and uh, sometimes violent. San Francisco State had a very prominent student strike. It started right at the end of 68, but it continued well into 1969 where um, students were demanding a black studies department, the hiring of more black faculty, and admitting yeah. more African-American students, too. And ultimately, even though there was uh, you know, horrible scenes where the San Francisco cops came to campus and beat people up, um, ultimately, the students were successful in obtaining um, uh, you know, pressuring the administration to create the nation's first ethnic studies department, the Black Studies Department at San Francisco State. And then likewise, UC Berkeley, my alma mater where I'm teaching now, it's very exciting. Uh, Cal also had a student strike in 1969 demanding a whole college of third world studies. And uh, that ultimately led to Cal's Department of Ethnic Studies, which is still a, an important force on campus. Uh, but yeah, 1969 saw a lot of campus unrest, um, no longer surprising to America, which was used to it, but uh, perhaps um, most prominently in the decade, Harvard had yeah. uh, a bunch of students occupy the administration building. Um, and you know, I can't imagine many people were expecting that. Harvard students demanded an end to ROTC on campus. Um, and once they had taken over the administration building, they rifled through the files and they found lots of evidence of their administration's involvement in the CIA and in Defense Department research, um, which they gleefully published, you know, for the world to see. So, you know, sort of WikiLeaks before WikiLeaks. <laughs> um, but this was another reason that college students uh, uh, focused on the war as a point of opposition because many of them were aware of their universities being involved in the military industrial complex as they called it yeah uh, and the defense contracts that their universities depended on that's great yes so uh, let me hop in with yeah, a couple please. of music things if you don't mind so so as we know fortunate son by Crins Clearwater was about the Vietnam War give peace a chance was about the Vietnam War. John Lennon and Yoko Ono spent the bed in peace, which I think was an interesting concept and, you know, on, a, on a number of levels, but, uh, but they just spent a number of days in bed to get the word about peace out there. Um, Joan Baez was the vocalist of peace, and that's how she, she kind of described herself. And uh, so that was a, another interesting thing. The fascinating thing for, for this guy was um, um, I, I was the right age to go to Vietnam. So I thought, okay, well, then I better, you know, like be prepared for that. So I, I went, uh, I hitchhiked to, uh, I think to Oakland from San Jose um, uh, to, to go to the, um, uh, whatever the place was that you, you go to, to, to uh, um, get checked up. And I went, pardon me? Induction. Induction Center, exactly right, thank you. And while I was there and going through the whole process and just thinking, okay, I'm gonna go to Vietnam, I'm gonna live another six months, maybe a year, and that'll be that, so that's the way it goes. And they said, do you know you have a problem with your eyes? And I said, no. And they said, well, you do, you have a problem with your eyes. We will not allow you in the armed forces. <laughs> and I said, you won't? <laughs> All of a sudden, my eyes grew very large, <laughs> <laughs> and I hitchhiked back to San Jose and uh, never had to worry about that again. The yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. The uh, the uh, so anyhow, but 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 while I was driving back, and by the way, I hitchhiked, so that meant that this young woman picked me up and she uh, she drove me all the way back, and we listened to songs all the way back to San Jose. Which, luckily enough, she was. She was going to drive me within a you know a few blocks of my house, and and they were all these anti-war songs, which were part of the world at that time. So I got to hear all that. Oh, and we'll we're definitely going to tap into your immense musical knowledge and experience too. But um, it's important to certainly recognize the the music that really created um, inspiration and helped 
lift people up and uh, got messaging out there. Absolutely. Um, but while we're, we're kind of talking about um, uh, sort of pop culture, um, 1969 definitely signaled a change in social mores. On Broadway, audiences were shocked by O oh, Calcutta and Hair. And on screen, films like Midnight Cowboy, I Am Curious, Yellow, and Easy Rider pushed viewers way outside of their comfort zones. The best-selling books of the year included Portney's Complaint, Naked Came the Stranger, and Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Too Afraid to Ask. What accounts for this shift? Was art reflecting the attitudes, or were attitudes influencing art? Who are um, you asking? Either, either one. Okay. Either one. Well, the 1960s were the culmination, dare I say climax? Of <laughs> nice. Very nice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's two sex references already, and we're only a few minutes in. Excellent. We're we're totally... (laughs) You brought it up. Yeah, you're right. You're right. My fault. (laughs) Uh, Of many years of loosening of mores, uh, loosening of standards of public discussion of sex. And this is the tricky thing for historians. I mean, we can always assume that people have been having sex in the past because that's why we're all here. But uh, we can't really measure that. What we can measure is the amount of public discussion of sex that goes on at different times. And uh, there is a gradual curve where Americans slowly came up from prudery. You know, they, they began to discard. An academic term. Yes, yes. I love it. Uh, slowly, they, they began to separate from the traditional sort of puritanical standards that had uh, made discussion of sex in public taboo. Um, that, that was a very old taboo in America, which, you know, people had gotten around with all kinds of sly um, coded words and, and symbolism. And, you know, if you like old movies and music, you know what I'm talking about. But um, there had been a lot of milestones along the way. I mean, Playboy magazine was founded in 1953. So Hugh Hefner had been doing a lot to loosen up uh, the discussion and, and uh, display of the naked human body that uh, was acceptable. Um, And likewise, Helen Gurley Brown's magazine, Mm -hmm. Cosmopolitan, came out in 1965. And uh, together, you know, Hefner and Brown were doing a lot to dismantle the old double standard of sexual morality, which had been so repressive and and, uh, pervasive in American culture for so long. Um, So, there, there was a lot of discomfort with the increasing amount of sex that was appearing in cinema and on the stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, even on television, you know, at the beginning of the 60s, you couldn't even depict married couples in bed together, yeah. right? They had to have separate beds. <laughs> uh, but by the end of the 60s, okay, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Brady get to sleep in the same bed. Um, <laughs> but that's as far as it went, but still, yeah. um, that was a big advance. There was a um, a major Supreme Court decision called Stanley versus Georgia in the year 1969 that legalized the possession of pornography and uh, really made just about anything goes. Uh, so that was, you know, the opening of uh, quite a bit of floodgates about public um, demonstrations, shall we say, of, of sexual material. Um, and of course, the the uh, breakthrough of hair, that uh, musical that you mentioned, where you know the cast members cast off all their clothes <laughs> at uh, a crucial point of the performance, that um, became a huge international hit. That was one of the biggest stage sensations of uh, the post-war era. So yeah, uh, the 60s were a time of the sexual revolution when the pill became available at the beginning of the decade, when Masters and Johnson released their report in the middle of the decade uh, showing that we were having a lot more sex than uh, maybe people were willing to admit with people maybe we weren't married to, maybe uh, people not of the opposite sex. These kinds of ideas were becoming more publicly expressed. And, you know, um, not to poach on Dennis's turf here too much, but just to use a musical example, the Beatles started out so innocently in 1964 singing, I want to hold your hand. I mean, what could be, you know, more tame than that? By 1968, they were singing, why don't we do it in the road? (laughs) Which is not exactly subtle. And then... They meant hold hands. (laughs) And then by 1969, with the Abbey Road album, 
come together. Think about all it. All right, this is quite the event <laughs> at the library. Dennis, yes. what would you like to say about all of this? Great. Well, the, um, a, a, a couple of quick things, but one is um, hair turned out to be so amazingly successful. Mm -hmm. Aquarius from hair was done by the fifth dimension and was number one on the charts. Let the Sun Shine In was done by the Cousels and it was number two on the charts. Hair was done by Oliver and it was number three on the charts. Good Morning Sunshine was done by Three Dog Night and was number four on the charts and Easy To Be Hard was done and it was in the top ten. So Hair had huge success. You're absolutely right. The sex sells. That's what they Well, it turns said. out sex does sell, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> and, um, and it certainly made it easier for you know, some people to, to uh, make that happen. Um, another thing that I just wanted to mention was Easy Rider. Um, and this, this is something that we want to keep in mind because 1969 has a, sp has a number of specific things that make it different. And one of them was that Easy Rider was the end of the swinging 60s. So that, that's what it meant to be, and that's what it was. So it, you know, we have to keep in mind the fact that, that, that uh, the 60s had this entire culture going on, and 1969 was the time when it hit the top, and then it shut down. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's interesting with hair. There was a great article about the 50th anniversary of hair and how despite the tremendous success and all the singles that came out and the, um, you know, the acclaim on Broadway, um, the Tony Award selectors um, were so uncomfortable with hair that when it was time for the uh, cast to perform at the Tonys, they made every effort to keep the sound down and to really um, interfere with their performance. And I think it's really interesting, the musical that won Best Musical in 1969 was 1776. Yes. That's not sending a strong enough <laughs> message in terms of the <laughs> anti-message of hair, I and, think. And by the way, as a person who eventually went on to start a music awards show that went on for 27 years, that year was really important to me because I watched that show thinking hair is going to win everything and it won nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the public wasn't quite ready yet. No, no, no. The public was, was ready. ready. The Tony selectors. The Tony selectors. Right, you're right. Absolutely. The, 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 the people in charge yes, were not ready. Not ready yet. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, because um, we, we often um, connect Earth consciousness uh, to the 1970s, but there were, s there were several key events that took place in 1969 that served as an early impetus for the environmental movement. Um, could you discuss these events and their long-term legacy or consequences? Yeah, the 1960s were uh, the decade when Americans slowly began to realize that as a nation we were poisoning ourselves to death. Um, the, the problem of pollution, which uh, few people had worried about before, became paramount. And uh, the old conservation movement that had been around since the beginning of the century uh, began gaining lots and lots of new adherents. Uh, there, those organizations like the Sierra Club that had been around a long time exploded in size in the 1960s, uh, the end of the decade. The big events in 1969 that uh, really raised awareness about environmental issues and uh, the, the drawbacks of our focus on economic growth without any attention to the, the cost of the environment. Um, in the city of Cleveland, the Cuyahoga River caught fire in 69 because those it, were the days yeah <laughs> uh it, it was so choked with toxic sludge that uh the material that was slowly flowing actually burned um and that was a wake-up call to a lot of people even more sensational and closer to home in 1969 the union oil company's oil drilling platform off the coast of santa barbara sprung a leak and uh, emitted an enormous oil slick, yeah. uh, 800 square miles, that uh, washed ashore in the you know, beautiful coastline around Santa Barbara. Many, many miles were suddenly coated in this thick, sticky black goo where um, countless birds and sea mammals normally lived. And now they died in this toxic disaster brought about by one corporation's profit-making activity and, I should say, one California governor's 
willingness to let them skirt safety standards. Governor Ronald Reagan was a big fan of offshore drilling and, and wanted to have as much as possible. Drill, baby, drill, like some people like to say now. Uh, we went that route in the 60s and it ended up with the Santa Barbara oil spill um, that filled um, television screens and magazines with shocking images of waterfowl and uh, baby sea otters choking and, and dying in, in uh, oil. Um, lots and lots of Californians volunteered to go clean up and save the uh, birds and, and animals. But um, this terrible uh, disaster really made people think again about um, this, this trade-off. You know, do we need to just pursue economic growth at all costs and ignore any other ancillary problems that may arise? Or is there something else that we should think about too? The quality of life that we're endangering by our pursuit of a higher standard of living. Isn't that important too? Um, public opinion shifted dramatically in 1969 from disasters like Santa Barbara um, and that's why President Richard Nixon, who was hardly a liberal environmentalist, was pressured by public opinion to create the Environmental Protection Agency um, at the end of the decade. And, to, and he signed laws that started the process of requiring environmental impact statements from corporations before they could engage in these kinds of environmentally dangerous uh, developments. And there wouldn't be any more new oil platforms off the California coast um, either. Another, another um, point I think in the 60s that, and 69 in particular, that helped to raise awareness about that are photographs of the planet Earth from outer space. Uh, the 60s were the great decade of the space program, the Apollo missions in particular, and um, once they were out there, far away from the planet, heading towards the moon, they were able to turn around and take photographs of our planet such as had never been seen before. And uh, there's something about the image of Earth as a tiny speck of green and blue floating in this vast dark universe, airless and lifeless, that forced people to think for the first time perhaps about how we have to protect uh, the only biosphere we have. Um, because, you know, it's not about saving trees, it's about saving us. We have to live in this environment, yeah, <laughs> right? Absolutely. So we need to protect it. So I think um, this, the culmination of the space program with uh, flights to the moon, turning around, taking pictures of the Earth had a great impact on environmental awareness as well. Yeah. Dennis, do you want to weigh in on environmental or should we move on? Well, just, just uh, very, very, just for a moment, I made a trip down to Los Angeles and, and looked at the, um, the beach, mm. and it was pretty horrible. Yeah. Seeing it in person. Yeah. Um, well, as this is a great segue to talk about the Apollo 11 mission, um, but I, I'm, I'm going to frame um, Apollo 11 uh, in a way that will also bring us um, attention to another event of 1969. Um, the Apollo 11 mission brought John F. Kennedy's 1960s promise of a moon landing to fruition. However, the extraordinary feat occurred while Ted Kennedy had to answer for what happened on Chappaquiddick Island. Um, could you discuss both events, what they meant to the American people, and how 1969 media coverage helped either shape understandings or um, keep the American people in the dark? Well, those are two very different events. Mm -hmm. um, the moon landings were the culmination of a very long campaign. Uh, to bring the United States to the moon. And really, the roots lay in the Sputnik panic of 1957, the previous decade, when the Soviet Union leapt ahead in the space race by launching the first orbital satellite in the history of the world, causing a lot of uh, self-doubt and, and soul-searching in the United States about how did we let the Russians get ahead? You know, think of the Cold War context, those of you who remember the Cold War days, right? Um, so the United States began investing heavily in math and science education and in the space program that was administered by this new agency, NASA. Um, so President Kennedy gave the famous promise to get to the moon by the end of the decade and uh, to bring men there and back. And uh, NASA was working furiously on that program to uh, to get there first, ahead of the Russians, and to fulfill Kennedy's promise. And boy, they cut it close. 
July 1969 <laughs> is, yeah. is when yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Apollo 11, the 11th Apollo mission, made it um, to the moon. And it was a great triumph, uh, not just a Cold War triumph for the United States, but it was a triumph for humanity. People all over the world watched in fascination at those grainy black and white flickering poor quality video images of uh, the astronauts, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, as they descended from the lunar module and bounded around in the low gravity environment of the moon and uh, planted that uh, sort of aluminum flag <laughs> on uh, the surface of the moon. And, uh, you know, some people think it was all faked in a TV studio, but historians don't think yeah. that. Uh, it, it was a great triumph um, of a decade of effort, uh, of, of American technology, um, of determination. Um, some people saw it as a waste of money, but it still uh, resonates as an incredible achievement for humanity. And remember, that's what Neil Armstrong was talking about when he stepped off uh, onto the moon's surface. And he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He meant to say one small step for a man, yeah. mm -hmm. but we'll forgive him for that. Um, he was on the moon. Yes. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> and, and we forget now that these guys, these astronauts, were the rock stars of square people. Right. Yeah. The straights and the squares who weren't into the Beatles or the Rolling Stones and you know, they put their fingers in their ears when that horrible music came on, <laughs> didn't appreciate their children's heroes. They loved the astronauts. Uh, they were straight arrows, they all had crew cuts, um, and you know, they, they uh, were always depicted with their wholesome families for NASA propaganda. And uh, I don't know if you've ever read The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe or seen the movie. Um, from the 70s, <laughs> they really captured that whole spirit. Now, ironically, the same week that the, um, the Apollo astronauts reached the moon, Ted Kennedy drove off a bridge. Uh, Ted Kennedy, of course, was the youngest Kennedy brother, the heir apparent of the Kennedy dynasty, legacy. Um, Joe Kennedy Jr. was the one that the family was grooming for the White House, uh, but he died in World War II. Uh, in, in a uh, secret mission, yeah. plane crash. Uh, then, of course, uh, John F. Kennedy uh, fulfilled the family dream of becoming president, and he was tragically assassinated in 1963. So the next brother in line, Robert Kennedy, seemed to be headed towards the White House, <laughs> uh, headed towards the Democratic nomination in 1968, until he was uh, horrifically gunned down in a hotel in Los Angeles on the eve of his victory in the California Democratic primary in June 68. So at that point, the mantle kind of fell on the youngest son, the last one standing, uh, Ted Kennedy, who you know um, was not as capable, uh, not as admirable, shall we say, as his brothers, and uh, who bent under this heavy load of expectation and uh, demand that he uh, get serious about his political career. He was already in Congress and then the Senate representing Washington. But um, for those who knew him, uh, he was not a serious person and was a party animal. I mean, he was notorious for that in Washington. So um, there came a night when uh, he was at a party in uh, Martha's Vineyard area in, Was in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, he left the party with a young woman who was not his wife. Uh, who and it, w it was a party honoring the women who had worked so hard on Bobby's campaign, yeah. right? Yes. yes. Right. So yes. It, there was a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of emotion around that to continue. Yes, a small party, you know, with a bunch of uh, these uh, older men. Married and, and men. And yes. With, yes. And the younger yes, women, the who younger women who were staffers. Who yes. Yeah. Yes. So he left with one of them. And um, we don't know if he was drunk or not. Uh, you know, what do you think? Um, <laughs> But uh, he, he missed a turn and drove into uh, a river uh, when he was on his way to a ferry boat back to the mainland. And um, Mary Jo Kopechny, the woman he was bringing from the party, died in the car that night. She drowned in Ted Kennedy's car. Well, somehow he survived. Uh, he emerged from the crash. He says he doesn't know how or why he survived. He doesn't remember what happened. That was his line. Um, but um, 
afterwards, uh, even more shockingly, he didn't report the accident. He didn't seek help from the authorities. Instead, he went back to try to get his friends to help him. Um, and he went back to his hotel and he called his lawyer and he, he didn't contact the authorities until they came looking for him saying, hey, we found your car in the river here. Uh, do you know anything about this? Hmm. Um, so, you know, at that point he owned up, but his behavior after this accident was terribly disgraceful. And uh, eventually he pled guilty to leaving the scene of an accident yeah. and not reporting it. Um, that's as far as it went. But uh, the American people were appalled, you know, by this, uh, shall we say, display of uh, priorities <laughs> or the kinds of choices that a man like that was making. So um, this was generally seen as the end of uh, the Kennedy brothers' hopes for getting back to the White House. Uh, Ted Kennedy continued in the Senate and became actually a quite effective senator for Massachusetts, but his uh, White House plans never quite yeah. recovered. He yeah. did make a run in 1980 challenging uh, President Jimmy Carter for the Democratic nomination, but he failed in that, uh, in that effort, and uh, his political career was never the same. Yes, well, and, and I'm going to shift again, and Dennis, um, I, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts um, about Woodstock. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was not the first major music festival, and it certainly wasn't the last, um, yet it continues to captivate the historical memory of so many people, despite the fact that the concert was rife with challenges and was not a magical experience for most people who attended. Can you talk about why um, Woodstock, what happened at Woodstock and why the three days continues to be celebrated and remembered in such a special way? Well, the, the, um, the specialness of it is that they, they, they really promoted it significantly. They made sure that everybody knew about it. They did a great job of that. They, um, they charged almost nothing to show up. And then, of course, they did another fantastic thing, which was they forgot to set up the, uh, the ticket booths. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so they had to make a decision because there were a few hundred thousand people in line, literally in line, to get in. So they just said, okay, everybody can come in for free. Mm -hmm. So 500,000 people showed up. For uh, for Woodstock, and that that led to it being a very well the biggest show ever, mm -hmm. and um, and it was uh, it was pretty successful. The um, the um, Woodstock was a revolution, and that's that's the way to think about it. That's 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 the difference. And sometimes with revolutions, you can't have control over what's going on. It just happens. Now, the Jefferson Airplane and Queens Clearwater were two of the first signed. And really, as a San Francisco Bay Area kid, hearing about Woodstock was incredible because so many of the bands were our bands, whether it was the Airplane, the Starship, Santana, Queens Clearwater, on and on and on. They were all there. And as uh, John Fogarty said, the, the bands came in by helicopter flying over a half a million people. And the reason they had to come in by helicopter was there was no way they could drive in <laughs> in the amount of time that they had available to them, which was one day, to get there. So the, uh, the, um, that was one of the, uh, the realities of it. Now the other thing was, this, this was an incredible kind of situation back then in, in 1969 was that a, a few of the biggest shows were put on by people who really had an emotional and, and exciting connection to it, but weren't the best at promoting. Now, let me just tell you that, that uh, and I have plenty of stories about this, but my mentor was the concert promoter, Bill Graham. And Bill Graham knew how to put on shows, and he put on shows in ways that made things happen. But like the Woodstock guys and eventually the Altamont guys, they didn't know how to put on shows. They just got everybody to show up. And, and the incredible thing was, again, that they got a couple of these huge bands to say yes immediately. So once they got, they, once they got the, the airplane and the Credence to say yes immediately, they, um, then all the other bands started showing up, or you know, saying yes, and included um, um, 
Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, The Who, The Band, Joan Baez, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Jefferson Airplane and Santana, Country Joe and the Fish, Ten Years After, Sly and the Family Stone, all of these, and that was just, you know, part of it. Yeah. There, were, there were more of those bands. And what, it, what Woodstock did was set up <coughs> a vibe, a concept, which was that, which is still happening. And I don't know how many of you people go to some of these shows now, but, but the idea is that you go to a show, you, you drive, it takes a really long time, you park your car in the parking lot, you sleep overnight, you get up, you go into the show, then you go back to your car and sleep overnight the next night, and then you go back and see the next, the next show. And this is, uh, this is something that's been going on ever since. But, uh, but it yeah, those Coachella kids think they invented <laughs> something that they clearly <laughs> did not. Yes, so, this is so did not. Mm -mm. And, um, and it's you know, just a fascinating concept. And um, uh, you know, we'll get to the interesting thing is in the same year, we had the high point and the low point right. with between uh, between Woodstock and uh, yes, Altamont. Altamont. You're yes. Talking about? Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> right, the right. apocalypse. Yes, <laughs> yes, we will definitely the apocalypse. We definitely want to talk uh, <laughs> yeah. about that. But yeah. anyhow, so in the case of in the case of of uh, Woodstock. Um, uh, the people who put it on barely got out of there with, you know, with their, without mm -hmm. being destroyed financially. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't make a lot of money, but at least they got enough to get out of it without, again, without being destroyed financially. Everybody had a good time, we think. The, um, and, um, and, you know, things happened. That's great. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Yeah, the the uh, promoters uh, were saved by the film. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The film yeah. was a huge they success. Yeah, the film was a huge success. They lost money like on the concert, but they had the rights to the movie, which yeah. you know was almost an afterthought, and yeah. ended up being a giant smash. So yeah. they, they made a lot of money on they that. They made the money on that. I'm exactly sure they were right. pleased. Yes. Um, I remember yeah. reading though, um, the Who were furious. Oh, yes. Yes. they weren't the they only ones. The the yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, and that with the weather and everything and the electric, the electrical issues, I'm going to um, pivot again um, because it's June and we're in Pride Month and um, the Stonewall Riots are receiving a significant um, focus and renewed scholarship. Um, recently, the New York Police Department formally apologized for their long-term harassment and violence against the LGBTQIA plus community and activists like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera are finally being recognized and honored for their role in the standoff with police. Um, how do the Stonewall riots intersect with other movements for liberation during the 1960s, and what do they tell us about contemporary struggles for equality? Before you get to that, yeah. I just want to say that, that at Woodstock, they were allowed in, they were celebrated, and amazingly enough, no one hated each other. Mm -hmm. They just, everybody had a good time. So, so that was an, in, in, you know, an interesting concept. In, in the same state of New York, yes, yeah. we have these <laughs> moments happening. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, uh, well, the Stonewall Inn was a gay bar in the East Village in New York City. And um, it was typical of gay bars in big cities elsewhere in America in that the police knew about it and the police would routinely raid these places. Um, harass the uh, innocent patrons who were just there to have a good time and meet each other and uh, arrest them for uh, all kinds of charges that uh, uh, sound like a, a foreign country these days, you know, lewdness and uh, perversion, um, things like that. A horrible time in American history when, um, when LGBTQ Americans were harassed just for being themselves. So gay bars were across the land and uh, were, were a popular place for gay people to meet. And the Stonewall Inn had been, you know, raided by the police many times in the past. But something happened that night in uh, 1969. Perhaps it was the civil rights movement that raised consciousness and awareness and demands for equality and respect and, and equal rights. Mm -hmm. um, but when the police came in that night, the crowd fought back. The crowd would not let the cops do their usual thing of harassing and intimidating people and busting a few and dragging them off to be humiliated um, at the police station. No, instead, uh, the police were trapped inside 
by an enormous crowd that formed outside and uh, was shouting and throwing things and threatening to attack uh, the detectives uh, who were inside and, and uh, were actually afraid for their lives <laughs> because they thought this growing mob was going to break in and kill them. Yeah. Um, so it, it was quite a change. The tables were turned. Uh, this is when New York's gay community fought back against the police who had been harassing them for years. And uh, this was the beginning, for a lot of people anyway, of the gay pride movement. The Gay Liberation Front was formed shortly after Stonewall, and gay freedom parades began to occur across the United States. Um, and this is when people who had been gay forever now began to feel safe to come out and to be open about being gay. There's nothing new, right, about LGBTQ Americans, but what was new at the end of the 60s was it became a little safer, uh, a little more possible to express your true self publicly and um, not to suffer you know, too much attack for it. So a lot of Americans were very uncomfortable with that. <laughs> it took a long time. We're still working on that. Uh, civil rights for LGBTQ people are still restricted. We still don't have complete marriage rights everywhere. But uh, this was the beginning of a major shift yeah. uh, when, when uh, the public sphere opened up a little space for um, this sexual minority. Racial minorities had been winning uh, many battles for equal rights at the beginning of the decade, and now at the end, sexual minorities got their chance too. Yeah. Dennis? Well, just on, on the personal level, as a teenager, I thought you were supposed to not like gay people. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then this changed my mind completely, and I started feeling more and more comfortable to the point where I, I had friends who were gay, and I knew they were gay, and I had no problem with it. And that was, that was something that, because I'm 10 years older than you. <laughs> so, so I got to experience that firsthand, and it was a wonderful experience. And, and then, uh, you know, years later, going into the, uh, uh, all the various worlds that I've lived in, the, the theater, arts, etc., and it's just a normal part of life. It's just a normal part of life. Yeah, there was something about the hippie culture of the 60s, anything goes, tolerance, right? Uh, that opened up a space for um, LGBTQ people uh, to gain acceptance in that sort of counterculture environment. So I think that was an important connection to larger movements as well, not just the civil rights movement, but the, the hippie counterculture, which was you know, based on if it feels good, do it, and, yeah. and not judging other people for their choices. Um, I know that we want to open up um, for questions, but I, I have um, one more place that I would like to go, um, and, and it kind of juxtaposes with the, the hippie and the feeling good. You know, the, the 69 especially had some darker moments, too. We certainly had the Manson murders and fear about the Zodiac killer, and then, Dennis, to your point, um, the local music concert at Altamont Speedway. Yeah. And um, it has been called the hippie apocalypse. Um, and I'm wondering if this is a fair assessment. Is what happened at Altamont kind of representative of the end of this decade? Um, let, me, let me go through that. Yeah. So, so one of the things is that, that, you know, there were all these fabulous concerts. The, um, I wasn't able to go to, to Woodstock because the idea of it was, you know, the traveling all the way across, you know, the country was a little too much, though a year later, the rock band that was in moved to New York, so we, we played within a few miles of Woodstock, but that was a different thing. Um, however, the Big Sur, uh, Big Sur uh, Rock Festival, um, I went to that, and there was Crosby, Stills, you were there too, huh? And there was Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young right there, which was fantastic. Uh, and there were lots of other great festivals, including the Isle of Wight Festival, the Jazz Bilzen Festival in, in Belgium. Um, there was, um, you know, all these great festivals, so we were all expecting them to continue to be great festivals until the reality is, and this is just something that you just have to keep in mind, there are producers and there are artists, and they are different people. <laughs> and when artists become producers, you can have trouble. So here's the producers. The producers were... The Grateful Dead, and oh God, let me find it. Um, anyhow, the the Rolling Stones. Well, no, not the Rolling Stones. <laughs> um, um, but let's just go with the Grateful Dead. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted Altamont because they they wanted to have something. And, and initially, it wasn't Altamont. They had a few other different 
locations that they try to have, and everybody's kept saying no after saying yes. So they finally got Altamont, and um, and uh, so there was a number of great bands that were going to play and were playing, but because they didn't have a real producer, because if Bill Graham had been the producer, this would not have happened, and what would not have happened was that they asked they asked the Hell's Angels to be in charge of security. Now let me just tell you personally, I grew up across the street from Cupertino in the 60s in San Jose. Cupertino then was the home of the Hells Angels. So I would see them all the time and they scared the life out of me. <laughs> and then when I heard that they were going to be at Altamont, I, I told my friends, we're not going. Mm -mm. And I'm certainly glad that we didn't go yeah. because what <laughs> happened, as you all know, is is one person who had way too much drugs anyhow decided to react the reaction was way inappropriate but instead of bill graham would have sent his his people in and they would have taken the person away and put him in jail no the hell's angels came and killed him mm -hmm. right there on the spot and that led to the uh, the entire show falling apart right in front of everybody. And by the way, the Grateful Dead didn't play yeah. because they didn't want to have anything to do with the show that they were putting on mm -hmm. because it was too scary. Yeah, Glenn, do you have any thoughts about uh, Altamont or is it as sort of a representative moment? Uh, yeah, I blame the Rolling Stones. <laughs> um, the well, you can definitely blame yeah. the Rolling Stones. Yes. The this was uh, supposed to be the culmination of their successful American tour. They'd made quite a bit of money, you know, playing before packed audiences all over the U.S., North America, and they were taking heat for it. Uh, Bill Graham used to get a lot of heat for this, too, about turning the people's music into a commercial Except you know, that Bill knew how to do it right. Yeah, yeah. I agree completely with that. Uh, went to a lot of his shows, actually. We all did. Um, but, you know, just like Bill Graham got a hard time from the hippies for making money off of their music, uh, the Rolling Stones were criticized for their very lucrative American tour. So they tried to defuse that by saying, okay, we'll do a free concert, and we'll do it in San Francisco at the end of our tour, and all the hippies can come, and they won't have to pay anything. And this will show, you know, that we're, uh, you know, we're, we're part of the movement. Too. Well, the problem was, they, as Dennis was explaining, they had a lot of trouble finding a venue. They thought they were going to do it in Golden Gate Park, like yep, the Grateful that was where Dead it started. had done it. Yep. And they thought, you know, we'll be just like the dead. But the city played games with them. They couldn't quite reach an agreement. Then there was another place in Sonoma, a, Marin, somewhere. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So they were, they were toying with this other site that fell through. So, I mean, it was at the last minute that they were able to uh, obtain the Altamont Speedway site. I mean, I think they had two days to prepare the site, which is not enough. I mean, you think <laughs> Woodstock didn't have enough preparation. Mm -hmm. I mean, Altamont was much worse. Um, a terrible site in a barren, you know, wasteland, uh, not far from here, east of Livermore, just off 580. It's barren and desolate when you drive it now, you know, <laughs> whipping mm -hmm. by on 580. Uh, so with practically no preparation, the Rolling Stones had the brilliant idea to hire the Hells Angels as security and to pay them with beer. <laughs> so, you know. Duh. <laughs> yeah. So it didn't work out. I mean, the Hells Angels brought their big choppers, you know, their big bikes, and then they got By upset. the way, just, just so we keep in mind, because like I said, I lived across the street from the Hells Angels. The Hells Angels didn't need any money. They had enormous <laughs> amounts of money. So th they didn't care that they were getting beer. They were having fun. Yes, yes. And fun includes killing people. Yeah. Well. One little twist on the Hells Angels, and not that I'm a Hells Angels apologist, and I did grow up in San Jose, and when I started riding a bike, I was a bit harassed by some of the South San Jose Hells Angels people, including Sonny Barger, who I got to know, yeah. who knew All right. some of the Hells Angels. Now, okay, uh, the professor in the middle, I forget you. Dr. Denzel. But yeah, it's correct that the Rolling Stones trusted the uh, Hells Angels because they had helped with the Hyde Park concert, and this was the English Hells Angels, which were very mild. 
Yeah. You know, they weren't guns, yeah. so they, and they were kind of cool. So Sam Cutler, who was part of the Rolling Stones security and production group at that time, had switched over and, and doing the job for the Grateful Dead at that point in time. Yeah. So Cutler was the one who said, okay, well, let's go ahead and get the Hells Angels to do it because he was thinking of the English Hells Angels. So this is actually a really good moment because now everybody can do their academic research on the two different Hells Angels groups in yeah, the right. United States. I don't know if there's been much writing about that. Well, I, I want to um, close this out because I know that we're at time and I know that a lot of folks might have questions. So Susan, um, are you going to collect question cards from the audience? Yes, if you do. <laughs> yeah. No. Don't. Okay. Just take it from the audience. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. Who's got a question? Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. No, just go ahead oh, and say it. Oh, you can go ahead and answer. You can go ahead and ask it. No. Oh, is it already here? Oh, perfect. Oh, but this is somebody else. But go ahead and ask your question. My question is for Dr. You talked a little bit about the Vietnam War. And so at that time, we had a military draft. So my question is, uh, do you think the military drafts has any impact on the United States' willingness to go to war or wage war or stay in war? Uh, so does, do you mean does the absence of a military draft today perhaps make it easier for presidents to send uh, yes, men and women to war? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking when you were saying it. Um, so the the military draft um, was instituted right before World War II, when uh, it appeared war clouds were drawing close, and uh, it continued after World War II at a much lower level. Um, men only, when they turned 18, had to register for the selective service, as it was called. And uh, the chances were very good that uh, if they were certified healthy by their local draft board, and if they were not going to college or doing some other exempt profession, like... Or had an eye problem. Had an eye yeah, problem, right. Well, right? They, they had to pass the physical, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, you know, there, there were a lot of categories of exemptions, not just college students. Um, for example, farmers um, were mm -hmm. exempt and... Uh, married men with children, you know, the, the army didn't want to get involved in trying to support families. Um, and uh, tobacco farmers <laughs> were included. Um, so it was a good way to get out of the draft, I suppose. Um, but, you know, it, it was a low intensity draft until the 60s. And then with the Vietnam War, the manpower demands of the military for this uh, gigantic effort that the United States made in Vietnam. Uh, by, you know, by 1969, there were half a million Americans in uniform in Vietnam. Uh, and the, the demands of the draft, tens of thousands of men a month were being drafted, called up. And the system was breaking down by the end of the decade. Uh, there, there were so many scams afoot for ways to avoid the draft. There were draft counseling centers uh, where young men who didn't want to be drafted could go and get free legal advice and uh, connect with sympathetic doctors who would be willing to certify uh, medical ailments that were, you know, a lot more questionable than yours, Dennis. But, um, you know, certain politicians uh, who are very prominent today were able to get uh, medical exemptions. Tooth spurs. Yeah, who knows, right? Who knows? Uh, certainly they got medical excuses from the draft for um, ailments that have not slowed them down ever since, right? Yeah. Very strange. Uh, so the draft had become one of the most controversial aspects of the Vietnam War because it was so unfair. Men of wealth, men with connections, uh, family connections could get out of the draft by getting letters from doctors, which were expensive, but you know it was possible to certify some exotic ailment or condition that would free them from the draft. Mm -hmm. um, men with family connections, political connections could get into the National Guard. Uh, you know, if your father was a congressman, like George W. Bush, mm -hmm. uh, you could get into the National Guard, which was almost impossible by the end of the 60s because so many men were trying to get into the National Guard. But if you had political connections, you could. But if you were poor, uh, if you had no connections, um, then you were stuck. Uh, you were more likely to get drafted. And it became 
a very class and race biased uh, selection system that uh, discredited the whole notion of selective service, which was supposed to be about prioritizing manpower. That was the rhetoric of the draft system. So that's why when uh, President Nixon took over in 1969, he instituted the draft lottery. Yeah. And you know, maybe mm. some of you remember how young men would be very anxious about finding out their that number. Was, that was me. Yeah, so that started in 1969 as well. Yep. Um, but certainly, I mean, in, more in, in answer to your question, I think uh, that um, presidents understand that uh, if we were to go back to a draft, it would likely make it much more difficult to build public support for a military intervention, barring an invasion of the United States itself, you know, an attack on the United States. So um, I don't think we're likely uh, to go back to a draft unless something happens where we need a whole lot more people than ever. Um, and uh, that doesn't seem uh, foreseeable. Instead, it's, uh, it's preferable to presidents to keep public opinion at a low intensity level where, where you uh, use uh, poverty, desperation, and the need for college funding as a kind of recruitment tool uh, that fills the, the need for uh, man and now woman power in the armed forces. Yeah. Somebody asked me about Alcatraz oh. Island. Somebody asked me about Alcatraz. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so I'll do a quick Alcatraz Island story. The, um, so, so an amazing thing happened, which was that Alcatraz was completely empty, and then all of a sudden a, um, a group of people, American Indians, took it over because they wanted to show that they, uh, that they owned California. And um, uh, so they took it over, and then this weird thing, I was in a rock band, you know, playing around uh, the Bay Area a lot, and um, one of the, uh, the, the women who uh, was running this whole thing w asked our band to come to Alcatraz to play. <laughs> so so I, I thought, okay, well that's gonna be interesting. Jailhouse so rock perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like <laughs> something like that. Uh -huh. So I, I, I looked into the possibility of getting from, you know, Oakland to Alcatraz and found out that there was nobody doing that. So uh, so uh, I uh, talked to a, um, uh, a, a, a shipping uh, company and they said, Well we'll take you over there. But then the then uh, then then they called me back and said, no, we're not going to do it. So I, I, I thought that I would try this. I sent, I drove to San Francisco, walked into the San Francisco Chronicle, walked up the stairs to, uh, to Herb Kane's office, and do you remember Herb Kane? <laughs> yeah. And uh, told the, um, his secretary what I needed, and she said, go in and talk to him. So I go in and I tell Herb Kane that, that, the Indians in Alcatraz wanted my rock band to come and play, but we have no way of getting there. So he said, don't worry about it. <laughs> We're running it tomorrow. So the next day, he ran it. That day, Creedence Clearwater called him, and he gave them my phone number and said, we have a ship that can take you there. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. So my band plus my my church um, choir, kids choir, we all got together and we got on that ship, on that uh, boat and we dr drove to Alcatraz. We go to Alcatraz, there's nobody there when we get there, so we have to get out and we've got these, you know, these um, amplifiers and things, and th but luckily enough the, the church choir is there to help and so we get, we get everything. And then all of a sudden some kids show up and they've got this big, um, rolling uh, thing, and they said, "Put it all on here, and we'll take you up to the to the." So we, you know, we go up, and 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 the Alcatraz has completely been empty for years, and we're walking and looking at everything, and up we go, and there's this big um, uh, area that that uh, that they want us to play in, and it looks almost like there's a uh, there's a, um, a stage, which is really just a, a you know piece of, of concrete. So we get there. And uh, and then all of a sudden, all of the um, the American Indians show up, and they all sit down in front of us, and they all start doing drugs to the point where by the time we're ready to start, they're all asleep. <laughs> and there's so many of them there, 
and they're all asleep. So we play, the church choir sings, we have a fantastic time, we're thinking this is so great. But the amazing thing is there are all these, and, and this, is, this is the distance we were to the ground. We were, you know, like a foot. And in front of us were just 50 or 60 little kids all sitting there, standing there, listening and loving it and just so excited to, to hear an actual rock band play with, you know, with singers behind them. And they said, do you want us to show you around? So we said, okay. So these little kids show us around. And by the way, one of them was Benjamin Bratt. Aww. Yeah, because he grew up on Alcatraz. His, his parents were, were two of the people that helped start it. Anyhow, they showed us around. They gave us a tour of Alcatraz that was unbelievable. And by the way, 20 years later, when, when I had a 13-year-old daughter that I could take to Alcatraz on a real tour, the tour wasn't as good <laughs> as the tour right, yeah, those little kids took, the, took us on because they knew everything. They knew every bit of it, and it was an incredible tour. So that was my, my time on Alcatraz, and it was an incredible experience. We were called Green Catherine, and the reason we were called that is because there was a band called Pink Floyd, so I thought you had to have a color and a name. <laughs> Do we have one, Kathleen? Well, can yeah. I tell my Alcatraz oh, story? Yeah. Oh, you have yes. one too? Yeah, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, Indians of All Tribes was the name of the organization uh, that was founded by a bunch of radical Native American scholars and students in the Bay Area. Um, and they got the idea in 1969 to take over Alcatraz, which had been, as I'm sure you know, a high security federal penitentiary for a few decades. But These are the same ones that were completely stoned in front of me. Mm -hmm. could, could be. Yeah, um, well, they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kennedy administration closed down the prison that everybody knows about. Um, but it had been a military prison for a long time before that, too. Um, anyway, so, you know, they, the federal government essentially abandoned, as you pointed out, yeah. you know, it was, it was an abandoned place. So Native Americans dusted off a treaty claiming that uh, they had the right to uh, claim uh, surplus abandoned federal property yeah. as uh, Native American land. So, that, you know, they were brandishing that treaty as they went out to Alcatraz and occupied it in 1969. Um, one of the best decisions that President Nixon ever made was uh, turning down the suggestions that he send in the FBI yeah. and, you know, force the Indians out in a bloodbath. Instead, you know, he, he just let them have it, uh, let them keep Alcatraz until eventually the expense of living out there with no water, no electricity, yep. no food, you know, yep. that's why the federal government gave up on it in the first place. Uh, eventually the Indians gave up and left after, I don't know, a couple of years. Um, so I was not there when, when uh, the Native Americans occupied Alcatraz, but I did go there not too long after, in the mid-70s, when I was a Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. We went on a Boy yep. Scout trip to Alcatraz, and I saw the graffiti yeah. Yeah. that the yeah. Native Americans had left all over. I remember yeah. U.S. out of North America. Yep, yeah. yep. Uh, I, I did too. Yeah. I was there. Red power, you know, yep. these things that were, were really blowing my mind, you know, as a suburban 13-year-old Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when the Boy Scouts went. This is great. Yeah. I'm sitting next to one of the yeah, Boy Scouts. Yeah, I was, I was one. Um, so I remember asking the National Park Service guide about the graffiti. And he explained how it was left over from the Indian occupation, which I had not known about. And uh, he said, but we consider this graffiti to be part of the history yeah. of this yeah. place. And yeah. so we're not going to remove it. It's going to stay. It's part of the story that we tell when we bring guests here, just like the prison and the, the older military prison. And before that, it was a fortress, you know, yep. that was defending yep. the bay. And that's there, too. So I thought, you know, that's really neat. So years later, I think I was in college at Cal, and I had uh, visitors, you know, who always want to go to Alcatraz. So we went to Alcatraz, and all that graffiti had been painted yep. over. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. When I went with my my kids, it was all gone. Yeah. It was a completely that's different place. Over. So I went to an NPS, a Park Service guide, and I said, "What happened to the graffiti that a guide told me years ago you were going to keep forever because it was part of the park, part of the place?" And the guide said, "Oh yeah." When Clint Eastwood wanted to make his Escape from Alcatraz movie, we had to cover all that stuff. That's so right. That's, that's exactly, exactly it. Look, it. That's yeah. exactly so it. Look more authentic. Yeah, that is. Yeah. That's my Alcatraz okay. story. That's Kathleen, great. Go ahead. So I wonder, this is to both of you, if you could comment on the emergence of television um, uh, from the 1960s to the 1970s. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about the 
the political satire. I'm thinking about Laugh-In and the Smothers Brothers and how in the late 60s, television, all of the families started to bring some of the issues of social unrest to American living rooms. And you repeat the question, and this will be the last question. Yep. Uh, so the question was about the, the role of television in the 1960s in, in, in politics and social commentary, right, you were talking about? Yeah, so um, for the longest time, the, the legacy of McCarthyism in American mass media was to create this uh, incredibly stifling pressure to avoid anything that could be the least bit, quote, controversial. Right? That was the kiss of death, controversial, could not be politically sensitive. Um, McCarthyism had, had really stamped out that kind of uh, discussion from so much popular entertainment and had to be heavily muted and veiled and you know, there were ways to do that. Um, so you know, TV in the 60s started out in a sort of leave it to beaver mode mm. uh, where Westerns were extremely popular. Uh, there, there was some point, um, in the mid 60s where most of the top 10 shows were westerns um, and you know so formulaic and predictable uh, unwatchable today at least for me um, those were very popular and you know political content was entirely missing but by the end of the decade things were changing uh, there, there were um, shows like the Smothers Brothers show yep. that you mentioned yep. that uh, uh, got in a lot of hot water with their sponsors and with their producers and with the networks in their efforts to put on controversial artists like Pete Seeger and other people who were outspoken against the Vietnam War uh, to, to deliver the most mild sort of peace-oriented commentaries and, and performances that uh, caused you know switchboards to light up with people calling in from Peoria and all across <laughs> Middle America and objecting to this communist propaganda beaming over the airwaves. Um, but yeah, Laugh In was a revolutionary, uh, in the metaphorical sense, uh, a program that um, sort of anticipated the the quick cuts and the fractured non-narrative style of humor that would become more common with modern media. All in the Family also came out at the very end of the decade, uh, which got America to laugh at itself, uh, you know, dramatizing the generation gap that was splitting apart so many families and neighborhoods with this really brilliant writing and uh, acting. <laughs> well, one of the things that, well. that, mm -hmm. that we should all remember from, from the coming from the entertainment industry is that if something is getting big numbers, it wins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that was what was going on then. So even though there were there were people in TV guides saying, you know, well, the all in the family or you know, laughing should be eradicated. No, because the numbers were so good. My my son-in-law worked at Saturday Night Live. The numbers were fabulous. They've continued to be fabulous, and they're doing great. Uh, my daughter uh, is on Barry and uh, and uh, the Good Place, and in both those shows. The, um, again, the numbers are so good that it doesn't matter what they're saying, mm -hmm. even though, again, there are people that have problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't matter what they're saying, as long as the numbers are good in the world of entertainment, mm -hmm. that wins. But they did take the we, off. Yeah. We're well, but that was, that was that they took the Smothers Brothers off, but that's because the numbers were starting to go down. <laughs> yes. We're going to have to close. That is, that's the amazing <laughs> thing that no one talks about now, but at the time, the numbers were going down. Um, I think that Dennis and Dr. Genzel might stay around for a few minutes if you have some other follow-up questions. But we thank you so much for your attention and enthusiasm. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you, thank for you for inviting us. Thank yeah. you for inviting us. And let, let me just say that Meg was one of my favorite graduate students oh. ever. <laughs> Thanks, Meg. It's good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely.